Welcome to Nantucket. I'm Kelly Williams, President of the Board of Trustees of the Nantucket Historical Association and Chair of this year's Nantucket by Design. And I am thrilled to welcome you here to our beautiful little island. I want to thank my dear friend Stacy Bucus, who's chairing our luncheon today, for extending the invitation to Alessandra to be our speaker. As many of you know, Stacy Bucus is an icon in the design industry. She is a master of all sorts of media and is the creator of the quintessential blog, Quintessence, which really has been getting all of us through quarantine. And Stacy and her partner, Susanna Salk, have done extraordinary work bringing us the work of some of the most talented interior designers in the world. And we thank them for that. It really has gotten us through. And so with that, I want to turn it over to Stacy Bucus to introduce our speaker. Thank you and enjoy your lunch. Thank you, Kelly, for that very kind introduction. I am thrilled to be the chair of the Design Lunch this year and able to introduce my friend and colleague, uh, interior designer, very talented interior designer, Alessandra Branca. As Kelly mentioned, um, Alessandra was born and raised in Rome uh, in a family that was steeped in art and academia and learned at a very early age that classical beauty should and uh, is able to be integrated into everyday life. <clears throat> she believes that living well involves comfort and elegance and always a little bit of whimsy. Whether it's a beach house in the Bahamas, I'm sure you've all seen her fabulous um, place on Harbor Island that was featured in AD, uh, a ranch out west, a starter home for a young family, or a, uh, an elegant New York apartment. Alessandra is the quintessential example of knowing all the rules and then knowing how and when to break them. Learning to train your eye is an exercise she is an expert at and can't be emphasized enough, and why she is able to update classics with a fresh and chic fusion of styles and eras that emphasize comfort and versatility, everything so important in these uh, challenging times we're going tell their personal stories at home with classical details, rich colors, patterns, and textures, mixing them with vintage and antique finds, uh, modern and continental art, as well as always some contemporary bespoke pieces. And in addition to her residential work, Alessandra has also had many commercial projects, including clubs and restaurants and hotel suites, which I was um, uh, delighted to see her uh, guest suites at Windsor in Florida. They're absolutely spectacular. And, um, and throughout all of her projects, she has always incorporated bespoke couture elements in her work, which had led her to develop her own fabric lines, furniture, and uh, her new um, Casabranca collections, which I'm hoping she'll um, mention in her chat. Alessandra has an infectious energy. She is a tireless um, um, designer, and she uh, oversees every single one of her uh, projects virtually, not virtually, in person, excuse me. And uh, it is my honor today to introduce Alessandra. And let me add one thing that if during the talk you have any questions, please use the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your screen to um, ask the questions through that format, and we will address them at the end of the talk. So um, again, it is my honor to introduce my friend and colleague, talented designer, Alessandra Branca. Thank you, thank you so much, Stacy, and thank you, Kelly. Thank you all in Nantucket, the Nantucket Historic Association, and this wonderful event, Nantucket by Design, which is fantastic. I've been to it before. We will be back. And it's such a great honor. And it truly is. And I'm so excited to be here. Although I can't see you all, I hope you see me. Um, and um, this year, the subject was sanctuary, which was a very prescient choice uh, by Kelly a year ago. Who knew? that we would find ourselves it, understanding the meaning of that more literally and experiencing it day by day. 
um, I, I think I've always cared about the home. It's always been important, and my home has always been my sanctuary in many ways, as I'm sure it is for all of us. Uh, but never more than now have we sort of tested that and experienced it and maybe in some ways been happy to be there, uh, wherever it may be, whether it's your house in Nantucket or your place in Florida or your home in, in, in Chicago. Um, you know, it's the home is, is our sanctuary and it's always been that. And I think we've just been reminded of it. In my case, um, sanctuary means a lot. Originally, it meant a holy place. Um, it's a refuge. How much more of a refuge can your home be? And it's, uh, it's, it's a place that we keep sacred and we protect. And um, my interiors have always been about that. Uh, everything I believe in is wrapped up in this one word. And, um, and that was unchosen. It just happens to be what I believe in. And I think our homes are the most important thing, and certainly in my life and certainly in many of my clients' lives. Uh, so each of the rooms in a house have a meaning. And through this little talk, we'll talk about how the home is this living, uh, breathing thing in many ways, and how each of these spaces might mean something to us. And each is, in fact, its own version of a sanctuary. So without further ado, here we go. Okay, we start with the entrance hall. I chose this one because it is my entrance in Harbor Island. Harbor Island, like Nantucket, is a refuge for many people. It's an absolutely beautiful um, island that we found about 15 years ago, maybe 20 years ago now. E time is flying. And in time, we found that we wanted to put um, ha have a house there. And I designed the house. I built it. And I really thought about all the things that were important to me at that stage and which continue to be. Um, I knew that my, I love Dutch doors, which I know people are very familiar with in Nantucket. Uh, I love the idea that there was a barrier, but not a barrier, that you can leave the upper portion open and that you can welcome people into your house. And in Harbor Island, obviously we don't have do doorbells. People don't need such things. And uh, people will come to the door and they'll just shout in and we'll let them in. And it's another way to let the breeze come through in my entrance, instead of doing a big console and chairs, hall chairs and a mirror, I thought that the entrance was really like the hug of the home. It's the moment when you walk into a house where you're immediately brought into someone's life. And more than ever, even though we're all social distancing, we'll be back. We will be hugging again. And our entrance halls, to me, should be that space where you walk in and you're immediately immersed in the life of a family. I did a uh, center table and then I put a sofa in the entrance, which was rather unusual, and some chairs. And we have found that people sit in there all the time, and which is really the whole reason for any space is to be used. So anything you can do that brings people to a space and that makes them enjoy it more often, do it, because this is what it's for. The next image, next is another entrance. I thought I'd show an entrance that's a little more formal in some ways because it has a formal architecture, wonderfully designed by Shemamian in New York. And um, it, it's this wonderful running bond pattern, which is very classic. But we worked in a skirted table to make the space feel more informal, to make it more relaxed and to make people feel like it's not, uh, I, I, I love the play of high and low. And although this may appear to be such a formal room, that skirt changes the whole feel of the room. And then the fabric, this wonderful wavy velvet and, um, and needlepoint is, is another way to move, to put movement into the room. The mid-century lamps are another way to change it up and give it some spirit and make it welcoming. All things that sort of disarm people, interesting things with different character that I feel in the end really make a space what it should be. Um, my next image is a living room. Uh, the living room is very much, in my mind, the soul of the house. It's where we all come together. I grew up in Rome. I was born and raised in Rome, as Stacy said. 
and Kelly. And we don't have separate rooms. We have living rooms, and those are the rooms that everyone comes together in. And I feel very much that living rooms should not be an oxymoron. It should be a space where you come together. I don't really believe in televisions and living rooms. I feel that this is where different groups of people who occupy the space should come and read, talk, do their needlepoint, play cards, whatever kind of activities you might like. This was one that we did in Nantucket for the show house last year. I mixed some mid-century Danish chairs, some Billy Baldwin, vintage Billy Baldwin slipper chairs. I know that you're celebrating Billy Baldwin's design. He is definitely one of my most, my, my icons, my, my greatest inspirations. He found a way to, um, to again, to, to take a, a very elegant space and make it relaxed, which I think is really important. Um, and, and he designed these wonderful slipper chairs, which are, are iconic and, and used in many homes. The sofa is a Bilecki uh, sofa. I love the mix of the rattan. And then you can see in the background in the next photo, um, you can see that we mixed in contemporary art. Uh, we did the fabrics are all our Casablanca collection, which Stacy mentioned, which we prepared for that show last summer, and then we launched just recently. Um, the space is a mix. It's, it's meant to be comfortable. It is everything that I think a living room should be. And you can still have elegance without necessarily uh, feeling uncomfortable. And in this case, it was meant to be a house at the beach, so it's 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 relax the colors of the sky and a little touch of red which I can't resist of course. Next. Another living room uh, mix again with fabrics uh, paisley our Casablanca paisley. The walls are a painted linen so they're meant to be relaxed. The photo is by Massimo Listri. I love uh, contemporary photography and um, his work is fantastic because it shows these incredibly scaled interiors and it expands a space. Um, we have uh, uh, the 19th century stools, the saber leg chairs, the mix is there. It's meant to be a room that you can dress up in or you can relax in and be in jeans or shorts or whatever. So it's, it's really just another moment of my, again, my life, the way I believe that living rooms should be, they should be lived in and they are relaxing for that reason. Next. A corner of that living room. I love to bring games tables into living rooms. I find that uh, very often dining rooms are made to be bigger and they accommodate more people. And it's so nice to be able to have a lunch for four, like today, probably. People are having lunch and they live in their houses with two or three or four or six. Um, and it also is a place where you can go play cards, you can work. As we've discovered in the last few months, we have all made multi-use of our, of our living spaces, and this would have been a great corner to go and work and do your, your thing and, um, and keep your distance from everyone so you can concentrate. Uh, and then I think that then as now is as important, and I don't think it will ever not be important. Next. Another living room, uh, another relaxed living room. I chose all sort of relaxed environments. Uh, the photo is a wonderful contemporary photo. Um, the fabrics are all uh, linens, relaxed. Another dining and uh, games corner in the far uh, corner there. Uh, and, and really taking furniture that's wicker. This is vintage wicker and contemporary worker, and then some great upholstery to make it really feel comfortable. Lots of great light as well. Next. Not so light, a wonderful living room in New York that I did, um, pulling together lots of things that I, I really enjoyed. Um, the sofa is a, uh, a sofa that we designed, and then we did it in velvet and linen. And I do these wonderful sofa blankets, which we use to show pattern and also to mix up a room. I feel that they're very forgiving and they allow you to take a room and allow it to be used every day without any 
problems. Um, they can be switched and, and flipped over and have other patterns. Uh, there's obviously a mix mixing the tartan and that incredible J Japan screen, which is amazing. And then the paisley on the lampshades, which is antique paisley that I found. The Louis XVI chair on the right and the wonderful Gainsborough um, portrait chair uh, on the left, which is English. And the coffee table is by Jean Sen, 1970s lacquer and brass by Lefebvre, who made it for Jean Sen. And so the walls are done in red and white ticking. So it's, it's a little bit of everything. But what's wonderful about it is it's meant to be a dress, a room that dresses up or dresses down, depending on your interest. So that's my living room, another living room. Next, sorry. Ah, one of my favorite rooms ever. I just did this for a client who I worked with for over 30 years, and this was her living room. This was the space she spent time in. She had all the things that she loved in it. She had beautiful English furniture, wonderful art, and those unlined pink taffeta window treatments, which I think make the room and really make you realize that a room can be have elegant finishes, yet not feel elegant. It can be relaxed and lived in. She read in here. She really did spend a lot of time in this room. It had a wonderful Eastern light. So the morning light was very important in this room and that great contemporary painting. Um, and the Motherwell on the right. But anyway, the idea of mixing the graphic and the colors, and it's just a, an amazing space for me. And any space that is personal like this, to me, is particularly important. So bringing things that really mean something to the client, things that they've collected, things that they bring to the table that um, represent their life is what I really believe makes the room beautiful and even more beautiful. Next. My living room in New York from a few years ago, I rented a wonderful townhouse of the uh, second floor, the Piano Nobile of a townhouse, and I literally had one room. So it was a perfect room to live in. We had a banquette on the left, uh, as you're standing on the left corner, where my children would read and lie down and, and hang out. We would have um, our meals there. We would have uh, our TV was not in, in view, it was inside the armoire. And um, again, we were able to collect all these things but have linen and linen um, and, and wonderful old Fortuni, which I had found. And it's really just that mix that makes you feel comfortable. Neutral with touches of red, so it has a little life. And this room faced south, so it had unbelievable light in the afternoons, particularly in winter. So I feel that you should always pay attention to the light that you have in a room and where that room might be, which will make a difference to how colors are used. Next. A living room I did in Georgetown in uh, Washington, DC, a wonderful, very early house. It was a late 18th century house and it had very grand parlors and we decided to relax those rooms and do this impossible glaze on the walls, which took tremendous effort um, and could never be repeated because it took a many, many tries to get to. And we used this wonderful black and white chintz and mixed the graphics of the zebra. I ebonized the floors and left them mostly bare because it's a place where it's very hot in the summers and the client really wanted it relaxed. Children lived in this house and ran through these rooms. And it is very much um, a personal home and, and, and is, again, another wonderful favorite project. Next. A living room I recently did in New York City. Um, we took fabrics that were could be viewed as formal, like a Fortuni, and we did it on a custom-designed curved sofa. And then we did linen on the walls, a mid-century lamp, and then brought in uh, the uh, Candida Hofer photograph, um, which I felt really gave it some uh, some expanded the view and gave it a little more spirit. We have sisal on the floor, and this is the room that this family occupies. So everything is very, it's meant to be relaxed. There are children, two small children, 
who are in this space all day long. So it's a real space. And it was fun to be able to allow a space for parents and children that could be occupied and be equal. So j during the day, it's, it's where they live. And at night, they can entertain. Next. Uh, a library and an apartment that we did. We did tartan on the walls, uh, a wonderful ecot like embroidery uh, by Martin Ballard on the sofa seats, and then did a wonderful, wonderful lacquer, this beautiful blue lacquer. And it's, uh, again, a really great room that people live in and, and enjoy. And these are you know, the soul of the house. This is where people live. So all the things, photos, things that mean something to you should come to your space. Next. Ah, a room in my house in uh, the Bahamas. It's uh, actually the pool house where everybody hangs out. Uh, my children used to think that it would be their hangout, but because it has a bedroom next to it where my mother spends her time, it has now become what they call the senior center. Um, and we live in here. The sofas are actually the size, those sofas are have uh, seats that are the size of twin beds. So it made it so that we could expand when we have lots of people staying, kids sleep in there. And it's a really great, great fun room. Great colors for, as Nantucket, our red and blues. Um, and the spirit is there. It's the same relaxed atmosphere, but yet again, the soul of a house. It's where we live every single day, all day long when we're there. Next. Uh, this is a uh, living room uh, at, a, at a lake house that we just installed for a client. And it has a little um, dining and kitchen area off of it, and then a living area. And the whole idea was to take our fabric. Our client loved this fabric. It's a Casablanca fabric, and we just put it everywhere. The chairs are on swivels. Everything is meant to be relaxed. There are small children in this house, and this is a real space. And it's, again, very much lived in. Next. I thought the next thing we could talk about briefly are kitchens. Kitchens in my, my life, being Italian, are sort of the heart of the home. Um, we've done many kitchens. This is one in an apartment in Palm Beach with a bar in front of it so we did pocket doors so you could separate it off so that you have sort of a formal side a lacquered bar and then this wonderful kitchen done with pecky cypress and uh, portuguese tiles in blue and white but i find that kitchens are really really as important as everything else they are the place where we do the things we love i love to eat and i love to cook and I think it's very important that they not only look good but they have to work and they have to be used Next, another kitchen we did, this one at Windsor, actually, as uh, Stacy mentioned, the suites. This isn't one of the suites I did. Uh, the tiles are our tiles, and we did a really wonderful white um, uh, kitchen that is lacquered, and then we did a blue island to give it a little kick. Uh, but I find that the, the more exposed you make a kitchen, the better it is, the more usable. And then you can always find places to hide things. But I think the more open they are, the better they are. And this one, actually, we convinced the clients to open up the kitchen to the living space, which really ended up being a very successful change in their suites. They had traditionally had uh, a wall between them. So, and that which has become a very normal thing in American interiors is, um, this is a fun example of that. Next. Another kitchen we just recently did at a beach house for a client. Um, the, the play on scale was important. It was a big kitchen. So I thought, okay, let's go for it. We did these wonderful big um, uh, wicker lampshades and then did a Casablanca uh, Madagascar uh, stripe our Branca stripe in the, in the grande uh, on the walls. And um, it's really just a way to be, to have a natural, light, fresh kitchen. Uh, and this is a client who actually cooks a lot. And this photo was taken the day we installed. And it looks like this every time we see it. So I know it's used, but she loves to keep it very orderly and beautiful. Next. 
a dining room. I chose this as my example of a dining room because I felt that it lent itself for all the reasons. I happen to love entertaining people and having them. In this case, this was in our client's house in, um, in Georgetown. And the dining room was the path to the kitchen and to the, to the entrance and living room. And I felt that instead of doing a room that uh, was, you know, uh, formal, we chose to purposely do this wonderful lattice on the walls, which took am amazing effort to install. And then we did a skirted table to relax it and make it so they could use it every day or use it for formal occasions. And then we have that wonderful porcelain chandelier which really focuses, plays all these styles together. The chairs were chairs that they had owned. Um, they were uh, Swedish, antique Swedish uh, uh, dining, neoclassical dining chairs that we did in an off-white leather. And then we mixed the leather with the linen and we played this linen color off the background of the room so she could have any color flowers that she wanted. In this case, we have a Polidori of Versailles over the mantle and we chose to play that blue up in the blue and white. But the room has been used for Christmas, for Easter, for every imaginable occasion, and dinner amongst the family. So it's, that's, I think that's something that we all need to pay attention to. The more you use every space, as I've said before, and the more we have all experienced this recently, I feel that that is when we go to design our next spaces and when we go to pay attention to what we want to do with our homes, I think bringing life to your dining room is really important. It, um, more than ever, I think every single space is important. But now we've all experienced it and seen it and enjoyed it. And in many cases, I hope people have reclaimed their dining rooms as spaces to go to and be in. Next. Ah the ultimate sanctuary, our bedrooms, which I tell every client is the most important room in a house, I feel, because it is where we go to become whole again. It's where we get away from all the things that we've been doing, hopefully undistracted, and we can read. We do not do televisions in bedrooms. Um, I really believe this is where you go. You close the door, you read a book, and you relax. Um, and, and you really take care of yourself, which is important. Um, in this, this is my bedroom in Chicago. I've spent a lot of time in this room recently. <laughs> um, the walls are upholstered in a wonderful toile, linen toile. Um, the uh, tablecloth was a tablecloth I had made in Portugal. Uh, and the Louis says chair was something that I bought at my very first auction, which was a, the Reitzman sale many, many, many moons ago. Uh, but the apple green, I always feel, is a wonderful color for a bedroom because it's like waking up to spring every morning. And when we went into quarantine, I had been planning on redoing this bedroom. And through this period, I decided I can't touch it. No matter how old, it's been there for 30 years. I love every inch of it, and I wouldn't touch a thing. I, it's just such a joy to be in a space that you love. Next. Ah. A bedroom I did in Palm Beach that many people know. Uh, I did a collaboration with, this is the Kip Bay Show House, the master bedroom. The, um, I, I was inspired by Portugal to do my collection for Degonet. I am doing four seasonal collections, and this is my summer, which was um, inspired by all the wonderful um, azuleos in, in Portugal. In this case, we hand-painted the azuleos and the borders and, and created architecture in the room. Uh, the bed is this fantastic vintage bed that I found and bought years ago at auction. And then we did a wonderful headboard and the fabric, the fiamma in the blue is a Casablanca fabric. And we followed the little edge of that fabric to play on, again, to play on the patterns. Uh, a mix of, of mid-century furniture, the Jean Sen end tables, and then the Louis says. Uh, fauteuil. The, the idea is that it should be, again, your sanctuary. Blue and white is, is a color that I love 
for bedrooms. And um, we also have the sheets in here, our sheets that we did with these. Um, with Casablanca, we're doing hand-embroidered sheets and table linens, which are actually done by a group of women who survived the um, genocide and had been taught by the nuns, the Belgian nuns, to embroider. And every single inch of those sheets are hand-embroidered, which I think is another incredible thing. Next, another bedroom. I love these four posters. Everyone loves them. But I thought a way to relax it is to do our, um, uh, our uh, papavero paper on the walls, which is with like a grass cloth. And then a white linen, natural linen paneling. Everything else is just white and natural. And I find that that is a wonderful way to have a bedroom. It's very fresh. You can do any colored flowers. You can enjoy any kind of, you could, uh, frankly, it's, it's summer, winter, no matter what. I, I think it works everywhere. Um, and in this case, it's, uh, it's really a, another sanctuary within a sanctuary when you use a four-poster bed. Next. Uh, bedroom that I did in New York. Uh, the bed is a wonderful bed, a mid-century bed in plexi and um, and uh, brass. We mixed in a Moroccan bench. We have a wonderful gilt Georgian style console on the left side of the bed and a skirted table. The idea was to mix these elements and make it sort of summer winter um, and to relax the room. The light fixture is a wonderful fixture by Stephen Antonson, who's a sculptor in New York. A very talented, incredible sculptor who works with uh, plaster work and um, and and really it was a, a and and some great contemporary pieces. The the idea is to to keep the elements. We have the wool rug, we have the linen on. We the walls are grass cloth, the linen on the headboard, and really mixing all these things to make them so that you can wake up and really choose your season which I think is another thing a bedroom can do. You can sort of determine what you want to experience. So I think colors are very, very important. In this case, you really feel like you've gone away and you're not in the heart of New York City. Next. Ah, another guest bedroom we did for a client. Um, this is a talk about another sanctuary. We used a wonderful paper uh, done by a company in Paris, uh, Ixil, and they did uh, these uh, papers based on Turkish interior, uh, Turkish panels. And we did the entire room, did it, the uh, feeling of a four-poster bed, it's sort of a Liela Polonaise, and then the wicker, um, mid-century French wicker, um, slipper chairs in front, uh, the banquette, again, you can have a wonderful seating area in this room. There are cabinets with a collection of corals and porcelains, and now some more books. So it really is a place to run away and feel like you're in a different world. Next. A little detail in that room, which I thought would be fun, is a jib door. I love to do jib doors, and this, to me, is a wonderful example of it. A jib door is a door that is hidden and concealed, and in this case, we are able to wallpaper over it, and you can see from the light that it's open, and the idea is it disappears, and it's a wonderful, wonderful fun detail to do, especially when you have lots of other doors in a room and you want to eliminate some of them visually. Next. The entry of a place, to me, is just as important. And in this case, as I said earlier, it's the hug of the home. But it's even better when you can combine your garden with your entry. In this case, at Windsor, when I re-imaged the front part of Windsor, I really felt that the courtyard, as you came in, should be a space that you sit in, that you relax in, that you can be offered drinks in. And so we created this wonderful space and put sofas and the wonderful lantern by Jam, a stone center table that has a collection of orchids at all times. And really, they have used this for entertaining. And I really feel that those are opportunities, again, where you can go and you can feel um, comfortable and feel talk, you know, sanctuary is, is this moment, frankly, in all of our lives. Next. This is my little garden. This has been my little sanctuary for many, many months. Um, 
this is my garden in Chicago. It's a little small garden at the back of our townhouse, which was built a year after the fire in 1871. Our home has um, really the interesting thing for me is that someone had asked me long ago where I would go to, um, where my sanctuary would be. I probably would have said Rome first. And it was very interesting to find myself at home. Uh, we lived through all the changes of seasons. We went from snow to spring to summer. I have never loved my home more than I have recently. It has really become, it, it just makes you realize that wherever you are is your sanctuary, and it's all about what you put into it. Uh, you know, our garden is where we eat every day in the summer. I have breakfast out there. I have coffee. I work at that table. I hang out with, uh, we've had our daughter was able to come and visit us and stay for a few months. And we spent time out there. And I realized that the only, the way I wanted to end my talk is to say that no matter what space, make it count. And really think about that when you walk away today, really go back and look at your rooms and think, am I giving them the love? Are they giving the love back? And are they representing that place that's important to me? And if they don't, do something new, figure something out, move things out, and concentrate on what I believe is important, which we have been taught so much recently, which is our sanctuary is in here. And our homes should represent that. So thank you for listening. I am so happy to have been here. I am, hope everyone's enjoyed this. It's very awkward that we have this world. I hope that the next time I actually see faces and people. But um, thank you for joining me for this. It's been such an honor. Okay, so someone is asking about the um, sofa blankets you do and whether they are meant to be um, used constantly or removed, and you can say what you envision oh, for those. You know what, we use them everywhere. We, we started it out as a way to bring pattern to a room for a client who did not want much pattern. And I thought, you know what, why don't we do this? I grew up in Italy, we had these sofa blankets, which you would see at the Agnelli's apartment. You would see it from everyone's home. It was not a, you know, it was actually something that was done in the 70s and 80s when I grew up and they were Indian and they were these really wonderful throws that people would use. But the beauty of them is it was a way to bring in pattern, but then also a way, frankly, to protect your sofa. So if you do want to have a white sofa and you have a, family living in a room, I think they're a really great way to do it. We have done um, sofa blankets where we make them with cashmere on one side and linen on the other or paisley and linen. So we have summer, winter, you can dress it up, dress it down. And really it's nothing, I, I think they're beautiful. I think it's a wonderful way to design and bring, you know, some character to a room without much effort. Well, I couldn't agree more. And I want to know if you're going to do them for Casablanca. Yay! We are. We are. They're Yay. actually they're actually packed up in boxes. But anyway, oh, I'm so did not plan that question. <laughs> no, that was for me I because know. I think they're also great for like me for families with dogs. Yeah. Oh, you're right. Oh my God. Yes. Yes. You know, oh, we have to put. We'll have to put Teflon in them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's see what else we have. Um, oh, here's one from um, Steel Marcou. The editor in chief Hello, of Random Magazine. Hi, Steele. Steel. Thanks for joining us. She said, "Great talk." And she said, "What ways, perhaps unexpected, have you used your garden lately? Do you ever work out there?" Oh gosh, yes, I do. I'm actually we we go over every single day. I work half a block from my uh, my home in Chicago, and I literally go at lunchtime, or I'll go and sit and talk and meet with people. Um, I, I really use my garden a lot, and much more than I ever did. I always did, but I really use it now. I mean, I wake up in the morning and go down and have coffee very early, and then I've even thought of working out out there, which is my latest new craze. <laughs> In, in this time. But I thought, you know, why not? Why couldn't I put a yoga mat down and put my Zoom class with my trainer and work out out there? That's, I mean, the beauty of this time is that we've all had to really 
focus on where we are and you want to use every inch of where you are and and your garden particularly you know when you're there you know my home used to be where I drop off my suitcase basically and I was going from place to place I traveled 160,000 miles last over that last year but that was my norm and so you know I, I had never spent day in and day out and week and week after week in and week out so I really think that your garden should be more than just a place where you put plants or whatever I think bring your computer out there live live out there enjoy it we've been uh just to add and yeah. to what you just said um i'm obviously here on nantucket with some kids who are working full-time remotely and we've been using our terrace all the time it's a fantastic work spot okay. um we have tons of questions actually kelly uh williams our chair uh, asked if you could talk about your love of the color red oh boy this is the question I always get. Okay, yeah. so my love of the color red, I don't know where it started. I just love the spirit of red. And there are times, and this is really coming from God knows where, there are times that I wonder if red, it's, it's a universal color. You see it everywhere in every, in every country and every style. Um, I love Pompeii and red, and I look at those wonderful rooms and think, my God, they started even then. every environment but what i don't do is i have not yet done a room where it's everything is red i think red is like a spice you use a little bit of it or you use a little more but you use it in good measure and that's how i enjoy it you're wearing a red shirt how smart of you i didn't <laughs> but i have this <laughs> i have one of my nine second colors <laughs> yeah there you go um, we have, have a million blue and red <laughs> yeah, there you go we have a million great questions i love this question what would be a dream project for you, something you haven't had a chance to do yet? Mm. If there is something you haven't oh, had no, a chance no. to do Oh, no, there are so many. I think, you know, I believe you only grow from doing new things. Mm -hmm. And I am never, I've, I literally look forward to, the, to anything that's the, out there. Um, I would say I would love to do a house in Morocco because I love Morocco, but I'd love to see Morocco done my way, um, if that makes sense. Uh, another place that I'd love to do is a house in the mountains. In, uh, in I'd love Sud Tyrol, which is the area in the north of Italy that's Tyrol, um, just because there is such an incredible history in that area, and there are wonderful 18th century structures that people never see, and I would love to see that. I've done boats, I've done planes. That. I mean, it would be interesting. And I've been, we've been designing Cabin, our next um, collection for the fall. And that's what inspired me most is, you know, cabin life. How does it oh, work? I think, I think we need a Casablanca blanket that's faux fur in cashmere. <laughs> oh, there's a good one. Yes, faux um, fur. It's got to be faux. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, now, you did mention about how you had considered redoing your beautiful uh, pillament tall bedroom and decided not to. And one person asked, now that you have been at home, more than usual room in your home, would you like to do over if there is one? You know which room I want to, um, I I'd love to relax my living room. My living room, I have a, a library where we live and we have lived far more than we ever thought. And um, we have a living room where we do pull everyone together. And recently I thought, I'm going to give it a little, little bit of a, little, I want to do slip covers. I want to really take it down a notch and have fun with it. And really make it, because I've spent lots of time in there. I like to go in there because we have a fireplace and in the morning when it's cold, it's a perfect room to go and read. And mm -hmm. I just would love to make it so it's more accessible in some ways. All right. And just so you know, we have tons of people yeah. just chiming in to say what okay. a great talk it was and how inspirational oh, it was. I just want to tell you, you that thank that aren't you, particularly questions. And uh, one woman who had, who, oh, it's my friend Mary Lou, who said, having visited many a Georgetown house over her 50 years in Washington, never have I enjoyed a home more than the one you designed on Dumbarton Avenue. It oh. was stunning and brought so much joy to the family who lived there and every lucky visitor. 
Thank you, Mary Lou, for that. How lovely. Mary Lou, um, you who know, understand why I had a little moment when I was talking about that space. It's, um, it, it's a space, you know, everyone, we all work and we all do beautiful, you know, I have wonderful clients and wonderful projects, but there's always a few that really sort of send you. And that one definitely did. It's just an amazing, an amazing family, amazing experience. It was the third home, fourth home I've done for them. Wow. Amazing. It's, it's a really a joy. Um, so another person has asked, um, Oh, someone, okay, someone, somebody, someone else has asked um, what you suggest for um, not a major update to improve your home for all this time we're spending at home now, you know. For oh, my God. These, yeah. You know, uh, one thing, so here's an interesting, strange discipline that I had and that I continue to have. When, my, when I grew up, my grandmother, the way they would clean um, is they would take every single thing out of the room two to three times a year. And then everything got cleaned very, very, I mean, they polished the marble floors. It was all the way. It was very thorough. And then you brought things back in. And I have this memory of a table and my grandmother pulling things and things going not where they've been. I have suggested that to many clients. First of all, I would do that. Do it today or tomorrow or the next rainy day. Go and take things out of a room leave them out, walk away from it, and come back and only put back the things that you actually care about. Because we all have things that end up in rooms. The second thing I would do is I would look at lampshades, pillows, sofa blankets. Mm -hmm. I would look at slip covering a chair here and there. You don't have to do a whole room over to have a new mm -hmm. feel. You can actually just do a chair seat and throw new pillows in a room and you feel that there's something new. It's, oh, it doesn't it, take that much. That's a suggestion because it, it allows you to see the room freshly. Yes. You mm -hmm. have to walk it. You have to, you have to actually, it's like wiping the slate. You have yeah, to yeah, do yeah. it. Yeah, almost literally. Yeah. Um, okay. And here's someone. And do deep clean while you're doing it. It's amazing <laughs> what you discover. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Right? I'm, I'm almost afraid to do it in my house. Dust bunnies this big. Yeah. <laughs> Um, let's see. So here is someone who, um, okay, that's a hard question to answer. Let me see. Uh -oh. Um, oh, someone says they like both of our, uh, Zoom backgrounds. Uh -oh. Oh, uh, oh, the editor in chief, Jenna, Jenna, um, Talbot, who is the editor in chief at New England Home Magazine. Uh, Hello. Ciao, Jenna. Yeah, said uh, she loved your talk. Um, I'm trying to find a specific question. There was someone. Um, Come on, someone stump us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, there's so many. I'm just scrolling through right now. Um, there was someone, and I can't find it right now because there's so many questions, but there was someone who is a student uh, in interior design and wanted to know the best way to get into the industry. Well. Let's see. We'll take any job they give you because these days they're blessings. So start there. Go and be, be willing to do anything because everything will count in time. Um, the other thing I would do while you're all home and you have your internet and you can do is study, 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 study. Read, 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 read. Yeah. Really pay attention to the history of design, the icons of design. Mm -hmm. Really... Um, I would say, you know, once you've studied interiors and you've graduated from, from school, one of the things I find is very often people just kind of get it thrown into a job and never really take the time to learn what makes something. So really pay attention to the history and try to learn how things are made. Really, uh, you know, I, I, I can't emphasize enough how important that is. And I believe you will find a job if you are willing to do whatever it takes. Because whether it's inventory, measuring, drawing, know your CAD, know your Photoshop these days, really know studio designer, all the different programs that people have, and you will be an asset. Whether it's, it, Don't be afraid of anything that people can give you. Great suggestion. And I couldn't agree more about 
you know, and I mentioned in my intro about training your eye, which is, you know, you had that incredible um, background having grown up in Rome with um, such an uh, intellectual and academic and art loving family. Um, Not into that, decorating. <laughs> but still, but still. Um, and uh, what I can say is that for all of you who are interested, there are incredible sources right now online. All the museums have special oh, yes. um, things online. And, you know, there are many, many sources to uh, get inspired and educate your eye online now without, while well, we can't go actually go places. Um, and Alessandra, I had a question. Well, I have a million questions. But um, when you, because you are so great at the mix, where where do you start in, in um, um, mixing patterns and colors and texture? Do you start, you know, some people say they start with the rug. Some people, is there any place in particular you start? Where, where does your concept start? Well, um, my concept starts with what the client needs, what the, what the client needs and what the, what the room can offer. Because right. there's, sometimes there's a bit of both. Right. You have a space and you have to decide what you're going to make of it. So we do floor plans, we work on black and white, and I really think about that. Then we look at what a client has that they love, and I make them really pay attention and say, what is it that you want to keep and that we want to use? What are your aspirations for the space? What are you looking for in this space? Is it where you're going to be in the morning? Is it going to be where you're all day? Is it where you want to dress down and be in your nightie, but also be able to dress up and have friends in? Um, if anybody even dresses up ever again, I mean, I haven't worn heels. Look at this. I'm wearing <laughs> Birkenstocks. <laughs> Me too. But anyway, so much for dressing up. But I do think that you have to be very, very disciplined about what you do with the space. Then you worry about patterns and color. If the client is happy with color, then you can saturate a room with it. If a client is tentative about color, then you can use it as an accent. If people are tentative about pattern, you can do the same thing. I tend to like neutral backgrounds and mm -hmm. then bringing in pattern in splashes. It can be a pair of club chairs and pillows. It could be a skirted table. It could be just the window treatment, but that's how it's just exactly like cooking. You just put as much as you can handle. Perfect. Um, so let me see. I think we have time for one or two more. Uh, people are asking specific questions, which are not particularly appropriate. Um, oh, God. Oh, yes. Bring it I mean, on. They're asking where things are from, you know. I mean, you can hire Alessandra, and then you'll get what you want. Um, let's see. The, oh, someone's asking if there are any colors, fabric types, or anything like that that you don't tend to work with, that you don't like. Uh, you know what I use? I would have said um, purple and eggplant, yet recently I actually used them with success because my client challenged me and I did it. They, it's in San Francisco. We just did a living room and I did what I never thought I would do. Um, and I don't think they're textures. I will say I'm not good with lyrics. I really don't find a way to, in, in spite of the fact that when you go to many of the showrooms, you'll see these sort of sparkly things. I've never quite understood how to use those. Maybe I'll learn. Who knows? Right. Um, and um, someone was uh, complimenting you on your spectacular uh, Palm Beach Kips Bay room, and, which was amazing. And um, uh, asked, well, you mentioned where the, what the inspiration was. It was Portugal. It was um, and they were asking that, and, and that led me to uh, another question, which um, was, how are your collaboration with de Gournay, are they panels? What is that? They're actually hand-painted, done for the room, so obviously we need to know the architecture of the space, you need to have some sense. Um, and then the designs are made for over doors, over windows, or uh, there's a wainscot, there are borders, and then there are panels that you could do on the ceiling. So we really work through all the different uses. And you can do something as simple as just do the border at the bottom, or you can do the whole wall. Got it. Okay, great to know. Just like the tiles. The beauty is we actually hand-painted, so everything is a little different, which is beautiful. Mm -hmm. And then there's actually like a glaze over the paper, so it, it has the feeling of tiles. And it's great juxtaposed to a flat wall. In other words, not a shiny wall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Um, okay, and um, 
Uh, here's a, a kind of an odd question. Someone wants to know how you ended up in Chicago from Rome. <laughs> oh my God, long story. I'm sure it was a circuit. What journey. are you doing for dinner? We're going to yeah. be here a while. <laughs> Um, long, long, long story, really, really short, I came to finish college. And then I met the man of my dreams who was here, and he was in business school, and here I am. I stayed. And I've been here forever. <laughs> Perfect. And we'll end on this lovely question um, from friend and colleague uh, Coco Vanderwalk, who works for Niven yes. Green, who you know. I know and Coco. Coco's asking, has a client ever had a beloved piece or collection that at first posed a design challenge but ended up a success and made a room? Great question. Oh, wow. Okay, let me think. No, uh, I wouldn't say uh, collection being a problem. Collections are actually an incredible asset because when a client, even if it's porcelains or, uh, you know, I've never had to work with teddy bears or dolls. <laughs> I'm sure that those would come up some way. But the truth is, no matter what you collect, very often collectors are wonderful clients to work with because mm -hmm. they have a passion. And whatever your passion, that is what's important in a project. If you have a right. person who has a strong point of view, it helps. I have a client who's a classicist who wanted just about every single corner of his house to have Roman, Greek, neoclassical details, Baroque. I mean, he wanted it everywhere. And we did that. We have clients who like Swedish, you know, Swedish um, uh, uh, painted furniture and so we end up with all of that it there's and i've had clients who instead start with one collection and then we you everything needs a contrast mm -hmm. so i think if you have too much of one thing it becomes boring so if a person has an 18th century collection of things so we have our piece our clients who had the neoclassical painting the the swedish furniture mixing in some mid-century gives it a kick and it gives yeah. it some interest. And playing with colors that are not typically seen in, in Swedish interiors is another way to exalt those pieces and bring them up. It's really just like, you know, it's a, it's a way to really think of the contrasts so that they can be best seen. It's that tension that makes rooms yeah. come alive. It's a visual tension, yes. Right. Both right. in materials, colors, textures, periods, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. art, all of that helps. That's how my interiors, I don't have a thing I do. What mm -hmm. I do is I rebel. So if people expect me to go this way, I'm going to go this way. That's very Italian. Of and course. I love, and the other thing that's Italian is uh, you don't really just decorate in Italy. Most people collect mm -hmm. things in their right. life day to day, and they bring them together in this space called an interior. And I I naturally tend to look for things that are at odds because that's part of my visual history. Well, fantastic. I, I think hope that makes sense. It did to me. Well, thank you, Alessandra. This was so wonderful. I look forward to You're seeing welcome. you in person. It was inspiring, educational, interesting, and uh, beautiful as always. And um, someone did ask, which I will um, answer, they ask if the recording will be accessible. And yes, everything from our virtual Nantucket by Design will be accessible, I believe, next week. So for those of you who want to revisit this talk again because you want to hear every single tidbit Alessandra said, you can come back next week. So thank you again, Alessandra. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you all. Thank you for everything and for supporting Nantucket. It's, um, it's a great thing. Thank you. Mwah to all. <laughs> Ciao.